Why are you here this morning? Well, she woke me up and drugged me here. Well, that's an answer. I know as a little child, that's exactly what mom and dad did. J.B. and Martha made sure on Sundays that Jay and Joey were going to church. We were drugged to church. Again, we could try to pretend to be sick, but when your mother's a nurse, it's hard to fool people. So why are you here? Why do you come to a worship service? Some people would answer because you're supposed to. Some people would answer, well, it's just what I do. Some people come to the worship service because they need something and they want God to supply that need. There may be people here today and you're longing for God's presence in your life. You're longing for God's power to be at work in your life. But I want to make a life-changing statement. I call it a life-changing reality. And I want you to get this life-changing reality, and you'll see it on the screen. The center of worship is not presence, power, or praise. The center of worship is sacrifice. The center of worship is sacrifice. And I want us to keep our Bibles open and, and look at Genesis 22 this morning. And I have three main points, and I want you to see number one. Number one this morning in the first five verses is this. Biblical worship, which is what we long for here at this church. Biblical worship responds to God's revelation. Biblical worship responds to God's revelation. In verses 1 through 5, we see that God revealed himself to Abraham, and Abraham responded to God. Look at verse 22, chapter 22, verse 1. And after these things, God tested Abraham. And, of course, now Abraham didn't know it was a test. Now, we know that because of divine perspective, but Abraham didn't know this at the time. But God was testing Abraham, and so God said to Abraham, Abraham, called him by name. It's good to know. God knows your name just as well as he knows Abraham's name. And But Abraham said, here I am. And then, of course, God says, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So to test Abraham, God commanded him to take his son. Notice this this imagery, his son, his only son, Isaac, whom he loved, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. And this blows my mind in verse 3. Look at it. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place from afar. I want you to think about that. Abraham obeyed God without question. God told him, now, I don't want you to get Ishmael. Don't go find Ishmael. You've already sent him away. No, I want you to get Isaac. Isaac, the son of promise. Isaac, the one that you and Sarah have been waiting 25 years to have born to you. We saw last week how when he was 100 years old and Sarah, his wife, was 90, that Isaac, which means laughter, was born. And they were able to hold little laughter in their arms. And they rejoiced and they wept with tears of joy. And now Isaac has grown. And he's probably at least 16, 17 years of age from chapter 21 to chapter 22. He is a strong, young man. And God says, I want you to sacrifice your son on the altar to me. Do you remember back in Genesis 18? When God revealed to Abraham what he was going to do, God revealed to Abraham, hey, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because they are horribly wicked, evil cities. They are worthy of my wrath. And I have come to the point of pouring it out on them. And you remember what Abraham did? Abraham pleaded with God. God, Lord, if you you find 50 righteous people in the city, will you spare it? He says, I'll spare it. 
don't, don't, don't get on me, but, but Lord, what if you found 45? What if you found 40? What if you found 30? What if you found 20? What if you found 10? Remember, Abraham is interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was pleading with God, the Lord of the universe, Yahweh, the eternal, faithful, covenant-keeping God. Abraham was pleading with God to, to have mercy and to spare Sodom and Gomorrah. But here, there's not a word. God revealed himself to Abraham, and Abraham responded with complete obedience, and he didn't say a word. Notice in verse 5. Then Abraham said to his young men, this is, this is significant, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. And what's that next part? What's that next part? And come again to you. (laughs) I love that. You see, Abraham knew the promise of God. Abraham had been walking with God ever since God saved this this pagan, moon-worshipping idolater. Okay? God saved him by his grace. God declared him righteous. God said, I'm going to multiply your offspring, and it's going to be through you that all the nations, the different peoples of the world are going to be blessed. It's why we pray on Sundays for different people groups that do not know the name of Jesus because this promise of God is true. If we believe it to be true, and I do, and we as a church do, is that God is going to save people in every people group on planet Earth. That promise was given to Abraham back in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And so Abraham knows God doesn't lie. God is truthful. He's, he's, you know, doubted God along the way. We've seen his bumps. We've noticed his rough edges. And he, like you and me, has them. And again, as we saw even last week, sanctification was a slow process for Abraham. And sanctification is a slow process for you and me as we follow Christ. But... Abraham knew that through Isaac, his offspring would be named. He believed that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Because he says, the boy and I, we're going to go worship, and we're going to come back. We are coming back. Now, if you look into the New Testament revelation, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. Listen to Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. You see, Abraham had faith that if God had him go through and kill his own son as a burnt offering to the one true God who had spoken to Abraham before, he has blessed Abraham, he has declared Abraham righteous, he's adopted Abraham into his family. Abraham was familiar with the voice of God. This was not the the hiss of the serpent coming through as the voice of God. Abraham had walked with God in a genuine faith relationship. He's the father of the faith, as he's known in Scripture, right? He's the friend of God, as he's known in Scripture. He knows the voice of God, and although this is an extremely unusual command, he knows that this command has come from God himself. And the only way for God to keep his promise would be for God to raise Isaac from the dead. Abraham knew that God keeps his word. Notice the theology of Abraham here. Abraham's theology was based on God and his promise. Oftentimes, our theology is based on ourselves and our own happiness. But listen, God speaks to us today through the word. And listen, biblical worship responds to God's revelation. Biblical worship responds to God's revelation. Think about number two with me. Think number two. Biblical worship requires God-approved sacrifice. 
biblical worship requires God-approved sacrifice. You know, sacrifice is something that the religions of the world understand. Did you know that? Sacrifice is the center of the world's worship. For example, look into Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, tribal religions. It's as if man innately knows that he is guilty before God and that he must offer God a sacrifice to relieve the guilt and to do away with the guilt. There's an innate awareness in all of humanity that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I mean, in the old movies, you would have natives out in jungles offering young virgin girls to volcanoes trying to placate the wrath of their God, whoever uh, that God would happen to be. But you see, there's this element of worship that's in you and me. We all worship. We are born to worship the Creator God. But that's exactly as we had in community group this morning in the Gospel Project. We're all idolaters at heart. The heart is an idol factory, as John Calvin once said and wrote. We're going to worship. The question is, whom are we worshiping? And, and so the, 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 the world religions understand sacrifice. In fact, in different world religions, they offer grain offerings, they offer flower offerings, um, they offer animal sacrifices, and in some world religions, they would even offer uh, human sacrifices. See, sacrifice is the center of the world's worship. The Bible even mentions the grain offering. The Bible mentions a symbolic offering, sacrifice, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, In Psalm 50, verse 14, the Bible mentions the sacrifice of praise in Hebrews 13, 15. The Bible speaks of animal sacrifices, obviously, in the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12, you may want to jot it down. 2 Chronicles 7, 12 says that the temple is a house of sacrifice. The temple is a house of sacrifice of sacrifice you see sinners owed something to God we sang that truth this morning sinners owed something to God and so therefore the sacrifices have been offered continually in Hebrews again Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1 let me let me share that with you real quick Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 4 listen to this the writer of Hebrews says this for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the blood, the the sins of mankind. And so, you see, these sacrifices are being offered continually in first the tabernacle and then in the temple that King Solomon built in Jerusalem. And can you just imagine that scene for a moment? You go to the temple with your animal and the priest inspects it to see if it's without spot or blemish. You have the sheep, you have the lamb, you have the ram, you have the animal. They inspect it. It passes muster. And then the priests who represent the people before God would take and they would slit the throat of the animal and drain the blood from the animal. And they would take certain parts of the animal out of its body, its carcass. And they would put the prescribed portion up on the altar of burnt offering as a a fragrant aroma to God. Can you imagine the smell of blood 
of dead, slaughtered animals continually being there at the temple. I tend to sanitize things when I read the Bible and see the pictures in the ESV study Bible. And it all looks so neat and organized and, and it doesn't stink at all. But when you think about the reality of that and what that means... Every time that a sacrifice was brought to the tabernacle and then the temple, it's a reminder of you are a sinner. And you deserve, what's being done to the animal is what you deserve. It's, it's a thought that hit me about two o'clock this morning. I deserve to go to hell. But God, but God, we deserve to go to hell, but God, but God in his grace has reached out to you and me by sending his son and he sends the Holy Spirit of God to help you understand this passage of scripture. To convict your heart. Maybe you are being raised and trained in a godly home. There's a godly dad like Abraham. And there's a godly mom like Sarah. And yet you have heard the gospel. You have had prayers at dinner. You have had prayers as you travel with your family. Your dad, your mom teach you about God as you rise up and go throughout the different uh, uh, things of the day. And yet here we are. And now the Holy Spirit today is going to open your eyes to the reality that I ought to. If I got justice, I would go to hell. But for the grace of God, I can be saved. I can be rescued, redeemed, and ransomed. You see... The Old Testament prescribed grain offerings. Animal sacrifices were often. There was a time, not in the Bible, but other world religions had human sacrifices. They were not common, but they did exist. So Abraham would not have been completely unfamiliar with other people offering their children to Canaanites did that. The Canaanite god Moloch was a Canaanite goddess of god of fertility, and and they believed that if they would offer their little ones on the altar, it would make them more fertile. We see a carryover, I think, from Moloch today into abortion, which is wicked and evil at its very core so sacrifice is the center of the world's worship but sacrifice was also the center of Abraham's worship I want you to look in verse 6 with me let's pick up where we left off in verse 6 22 6 and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and said and, and laid it on Isaac isn't that symbolic there somewhat that's a foreshadowing, right? Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And notice what he takes in his hand. He took in his hand the fire and the knife. Marinate on that for a while later this afternoon. The father took the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, uh, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Now, what I want you to notice here is uh, sacrifice was the center of Abraham's worship. Uh, Notice what Isaac doesn't say. Isaac does not say, dad, what's this stuff for? What are we going to do, Dad? Isaac doesn't say that in the text because Abraham and Isaac both knew that worship and sacrifice, that's what it was all about. If you were to look back in the book of Exodus, um, no less than 12 times did Moses and Aaron tell Pharaoh, let us go sacrifice to our God. 
worship and sacrifice are, are linked together. Now look in verse 9 where we left off there. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now think about this. Not only was Abraham preparing to worship God by offering his son Isaac on the altar, Isaac also was willingly being laid on that altar. Abraham is an old, old man. Isaac is a scrapping young man. If he's thinking like, Dad, this is, uh, I love the Lord, but this is going a little bit out of bounds here. (laughs) He could have run away from his dad. He willingly laid on the altar and notice his dad took his knife Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. In my heart, I imagine him kind of waiting on that. (laughs) But he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. for For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Sacrifice was the center of the world's worship. Sacrifice was the center of Abraham and Isaac's worship. Listen to me. Sacrifice needs to be the center of our worship. And that moves me to point three in the sermon this morning. You see, biblical worship responds to God's revelation. Number two, biblical worship requires God-approved sacrifice. Number three, biblical worship relies on God's substitute. You can't check out on me right now. This is huge. This is the center of Christianity, point three. (laughs) Biblical worship relies on God's substitute. That's verses 13 to 19. Look at verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide as it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord. It shall be provided. You see, God did not have Abraham kill his son, his only son Isaac, whom he loved. But 2,000 years later, God would kill his son, his only son, Jesus Christ, on that hill in Moriah, Mount Moriah, Mount Calvary. This is in the land of Moriah. And I really want you to look in your Bibles with me for a moment. I want you to kind of put your marker in Genesis 22. We'll come right back to it. But go over to First Chronicles just a moment. If you'll just keep flipping to the right, you'll come to Samuel, uh, Kings, and Chronicles. Go to First Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21. Go to First Chronicles chapter 21. And look at verse 15. I want to show you this. This is so fascinating. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 15. This is when David had taken the census when he wasn't trusting in the Lord. And David took the census to see how many soldiers were going to be in his army. And so God sent a plague against the nation because of David's sinful disobedience. But in First Chronicles 21, verse 15, look at it. And God sent the angel to destroy Uh, to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw, and he relented from the calamity. And he said to the angel who was working destruction, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Do you see that? So, So he's at the threshing floor 
of Ornan, the Jebusite. Look down in verse 18. Look at verse 18. Now the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad to say to David, Gad was the prophet, Gad was the prophet. Uh, So the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad, the prophet, to say to David that David should go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Do you see that? All right, flip the page, look at verse 28, 1 Chronicles 21, and look at verse 28. Look at verse 28. Verse 28. At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him at the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. So David gave God a burnt offering on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And remember, it's the Jebusites who occupied the city that David would call Jerusalem. Okay, now... Flip over to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter three, and verse one. It's great to hear pages turn. Look, look at Second Chronicles, chapter three, verse one. You you will not be sorry for doing this. All right, chapter three, verse one. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. That's the temple in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. The temple of God was built in the same area and vicinity as where Abraham had been led by God. To sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar around 2000 B.C. King David around 1000 B.C. Sacrificed a burnt offering to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And there right after that David's son Solomon who followed David as king. He began construction of the Solomon's temple as it's called. There on the very spot where David had offered his sacrifice. Now you can go back to Genesis 22. Amen. But you see, he was in the land of Moriah. And as God, God called out to Abraham and said, Hey, don't don't slaughter your son. (laughs) And Abraham then sees a ram behind him. His horns of the ram caught in a thicket of briar bushes. A thicket. He's trapped. And so Abraham takes, slaughters the animal and offers that animal in place of his son. And there had to have been tears of rejoicing. But here's what I want us to see at this point. God was not just pointing to a ram in a thicket. He was also pointing to another who 2,000 years after Abraham, 1,000 years after David, would be sacrificed on Mount Moriah. God was pointing to the sacrifice that is the very heart and center of all Christian worship, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it is that sacrifice that makes us righteous. It is that sacrifice that makes us whole. It makes us one. It is the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who is slain for the sins of the world that makes us righteous and whole and holy and clean and adopted into the family of God and accepted in the beloved that sacrifice makes our worship acceptable and the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 they'll put it on the screen 2 Corinthians 5 21 look at it for our what for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God look at it for our sake for your sake God the Father made Jesus to be treated as a sinner on the cross. As he bore the wrath of God and he paid the penalty of your sin so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Isaiah 53, 6. For we have all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Christ is our substitute. We do not have to die in our sin. There is a substitute, and his name is Jesus the Christ, who willingly, as Isaac willingly, he he laid out himself there on the altar. He could have easily gotten away from his father, but he did not. He was obedient to his father. He was obedient to the Lord, his God, and God delivered him. But God slew his own son. And no father in this room could imagine being willing to do that. But our Heavenly Father sent Christ to be our substitute. And Abraham's sacrifice was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. David's sacrifice 1,000 years later in the same general area of Moriah at the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, where Solomon would then build the temple, was also a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Listen, we gather today because we owed a debt we could never pay. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. They'll put it on the screen. 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous. He's righteous. He suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. We love to sing Amazing Grace around here. In fact, we're going to sing it tonight. Tonight's our Lord's Supper service. I want to encourage you all to come back and bring a friend. It's going to be one of the most powerful Lord's Supper services we've ever had as we prepare for revival this coming Friday night, Saturday night, and next Sunday. Our revival services with Dr. Rob Jackson. Church, it's time we got serious about God. We got to quit playing church. Sin, the wages of sin is death, eternal death, which means separation from a holy God in a place called hell. But you see, Jesus is. He is our substitute. And we love to sing Amazing Grace. And we will open up our worship gathering tonight with Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I want to challenge our men like we did last Sunday night. Though it was something. About 30 men up here at the front on their knees. Praying for God to send revival. That was a beautiful, beautiful sight. I want to challenge our men tonight. Lead your family to worship tonight. Be at the Lord's table for communion tonight. Be a man. Come sing Amazing Grace. Come sing, Jesus, thank you. Come sing, all I have is Christ. Come study Psalm 51 and allow the Holy Spirit to examine your heart in your sin and help us, one, 1 John 1, 9 that, and be cleansed and be revived. You see, we love to sing Amazing Grace. We also love to sing, Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. Because God the just was satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. Amen. Jesus willingly died on the cross of Calvary for our sins, for your sins. What keeps you from Him today? Why not? Why not come? As Dr. Jason Allen, president of Midwestern Seminary, said, you know, preachers, I've heard Dr. Steve Lawson say the same thing. Preachers, don't invite people to come trust Jesus. Plead with them to come and trust Jesus. Trust Him today. Because, you see, Romans 12, 1, 
Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a what? As a living sacrifice. You see, once you have been saved by the grace of God, we don't just get fire insurance from hell and then live life the way we want to. We have a new Lord. We have a CEO. And listen, the most fulfilling life is walking with Him. Whereas you abide in Him and He abides in you and you are a living sacrifice. Notice it. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual or logical worship. Look at 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. That's Jesus. Look at verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. That's us. We're that holy priesthood today in Christ. Notice what we do to offer spiritual sacrifices. They offered rams and bulls and goats and sheep and and grain offerings to the Lord. Those priests in the Old Testament, that's what they are. But you and I are to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, dads, dads, one of those spiritual sacrifices we can offer to God through Jesus Christ is when you lead your daughter to faith in Christ. And when you lead your son to faith in Christ, it is far more important, dads, for them to see you lead out in worship, not only at church, but in your home, in family worship, to be that godly man that God has has designed for you to be. So it's more important than having the right golf swing or the right swing of a baseball bat or the right aim at hunting a deer or any of the, nothing wrong with any of those things. Do not hear me say that, but I am saying that men it is time to count the cost and not waste our lives don't waste God's grace poured out into you by being caught up in the things of this world to the degree that you neglect the things of God which are eternal it is so crucially important and most churches suffer today because most men sit soak and sour on pews if they show up at all and it is time for the men of God to rise up and stand and to pray and to worship and to preach and to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we are praying that this revival next Friday, next Saturday and next Sunday morning and Sunday night will be a life transitioning time a life transforming time for the people of Crawford Baptist Church but also for the community of Sims and Mobile itself. I want to encourage you to invite people. There are little invitation cards and I have one on my front seat but, but they're, trust me, they're on the connect table. If you'll take one or two and invite people you work with invite people you play with, invite your neighbors. If we run out we'll print more and that's all the better. Invite them to come. Invite college students to come. Invite high schoolers to come. Next Saturday at 4 o'clock we're going to have one of the biggest youth events we have ever had. Young people do not miss it. Do not miss it. Make it a priority. Invite your friends to be here Saturday 4 o'clock in the CLC. There will be food, there will be games, there will be fun, there will be preparation for revival worship, and then that Saturday night we will have a wonderful service of worship with Dr. Rob Jackson at 6.30. Put it on your calendar, make it a priority. Let's be living sacrifices. Let's offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So where are you this morning? You and I, we're all worshipers. Our worship is built on sacrifice. I guess the key question is, is yours built on the right sacrifice or not? In case you missed what I'm trying to say today, the right sacrifice is Jesus. And the good news, one more time, the good news, is that the just and gracious God of the universe, the Father, looked upon hopelessly sinful people, me and you. Nothing we can do. 
spiritually dead in transgressions and sins. We're not floating in the water hoping somebody will throw us a life preserver. We are dead and drowned at the bottom of the ocean. We are on the side of the road and our heart is completely dead toward God. The good news is that the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people and he sent his only son whom he loved, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear his wrath against our sin on the cross and to show his power over sin by resurrecting Jesus from the dead so that everyone who will turn from their sins and believe in Jesus will be reconciled to God forever. That's Genesis 22. It's the message of the Bible. It's the gospel. We need it every day. May God work through the preaching of his word. Would you bow your heads with me this morning as we pray?